Welcome back to a special edition of the Night Report podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. With us today, we kind of alluded to it last week, but we have former Rutgers quarterback and NFL quarterback, Mike McMahon. Mike, thanks for uh, taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk some Rutgers with us. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into it. So at the time you, you chose to come to Rutgers, it wasn't the most attractive destination. Uh, what was it about Rutgers that stood out for you? And what were some of the other programs that recruited you out of high school? Uh, well, you know, I, I went to the camp, you know, Coach Terry Shea at the time. He was, uh, you know, a West Coast guy. West Coast offense was big at that time. It was kind of a quarterback guru. There was another guy, Mario Verdusco, who I really liked. And they had sold me on, you know, coming to Rutgers, we can be, we can start, we can change the program. We can be the, the start of something great. And, and so I like that challenge. And, you know, that, you know, we had a bunch of facilities that they were supposed to do and, and, uh, and I was excited. And um, so, no, I got recruited by, you know, Pitt, uh, uh, what was that? Pitt, Memphis, Vanderbilt, uh, University of Miami, and a bunch of other schools like would try to come in, and I was like, "Well, I'm committed to the Rutgers." The only one I really thought about changing my mind was Miami, just because of the weather. But yeah. uh, but my dad told me he's like, "Hey, no, you gave your word, and that's the only thing you got in this world, so you got to stick with it, you know." And and now you know you see kids commit left and right and change your mind. But um, no, you know everything works out. You know, it happens for a reason. It worked out. You know, I ended up, uh, you know accomplishing some dreams is the only thing I wish was, you know, we never got the facilities when I was there. And then when, unfortunately, when coach Ciano came in, you know, I, I missed him unfortunately by one year and, uh, and he came in and got it done. I think they kind of, I'm not sure the exact details, but from what I've heard, you know, not directly from him, from other people, you know, something along the lines, like, you know, they got these facilities and he was like, listen, I'm, if I come there, you know, I'm going to get these facilities. And then they did. And, and he's done a great job of building that program up. And he ended up moving on to Tampa. And now he's back. And uh, I think they're on the right track again. And I'm really excited that he's back. Now, now I know when we were talking the other day, uh, you mentioned you were going to go to the scrimmage or one of the practices. Um, did, did you jump? Yeah, geez. Did you end up going? And uh, what did what kind of stood out to you other than the facilities? Yeah, no, uh, you know, I, I reached out to Cosciano, uh a couple of weeks ago and asked him, you know, if I could stop in, you know, watch a little spring practice, sit on some meetings. He was awesome. Let me come into some of the to the player meetings. Let me sit on some staff meetings. Uh, it was a great learning opportunity for me, uh, you know, because I've coached at the D2 level. I've coached uh, multiple years at high school and just to see a behind the scenes at a higher level. Uh, a lot of times you think you, you know, you, you have a pretty good grasp on things and then you go and sit in an atmosphere like that. And you're like, man, I, I, I'm still learning, you know? So it was a great opportunity for me. Uh, that was like what, two weeks ago, uh, went out to some practices and then, uh, I went back to Pittsburgh and he said, Hey, anytime you want, come on back. And so, uh, I decided to come back, you know, they had the coaches clinic. I thought it was a great opportunity for just to sit there and listen to all the coaches. Cause typically when I went, when I would go to Rutgers, I'll sit in the offensive coordinator, uh, Kirk Shiraka and the QB mm -hmm. room, just to try to learn as much as I can there. But now, um, the, the coaches clinic, all, I got a chance to listen to all the offensive coaches, different drills, different techniques from positions. And it was awesome. It was probably one of the, the best coaching clinics I've ever been to. There was a guy every hour on the hour, Coach Belichick was there. Uh, and so I messaged uh, Coach Gianna, I'd like to come to it. I'd like to come the day before if I could. And, and he was like, awesome. And he was like, don't worry about it. You're my guest, just come. Uh, we'll see you, we'll be happy to have, your, have you. And uh, went into some meetings and then was out there for the scrimmage and uh, you know got a chance to uh, see some things. It, it's It's really good because you know, a lot of guys get to go, a lot of the high school coaches that went to the clinic could sit there and watch the scrimmage and stuff, but a lot of them don't really know what's going on because Coach Yana allowed me some access to some of the meetings. You know, I, I kind of could pick up on some of the plays and kind of knew beforehand what was going on. So it was a great opportunity for me, a great learning experience. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful that he allowed me to sit in and, and, and just, you know, kind of be a fly on the wall or be a sponge and absorb everything. So I don't want to break any confidence there, but what were some of the things that stood out to you about uh, 
the Rutgers offense and Kirk Soraka's offense in general? You know, the one thing I I saw, and it's not just Coach Soraka's offense, it's across the coaches, across the board, is the detail. They're extremely detailed. And um, they do a lot of great things. And, you know, it, it was funny, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, you've got a, and a great quarterback, too, with Gavin uh, Wimsett. I mean, he is a big athletic guy. And I, when I first met him, you know, I thought he was a tight end. He was so big. You know, he's he's a yeah. full six three, <laughs> two twenty five, and uh, and I you know I was like, man, I'm I'm curious to see how he can move, and he can move as well. So, uh, and and he's got a cannon for an arm. So before I went into the meeting, you know, I was talking to Coach Giano, and I was like, man, the way the offenses are now today, the way the 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 game protects the players, the quarterbacks, they protect the receivers. It's all about fantasy football now. And, uh, (laughs) and when I played, it was all about, he got jacked up, you know, he got jacked up. And I was on (laughs) quite a few of those clips, but I told him, I was like, man, I was, I was born 20 years too early and and with the money now too, you know? And then I was going to say that because your play style would be like perfect for today's NFL with the mobility, how much that's focused. And back in the day, you're just getting creamed on, on rollouts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and I always say that, but it was funny because after I watched, you know, the the offense practice the first time on the field uh uh gavin uh i i saw coach ciano again and i said man i said i wish i I was born 20 years too uh too early you know maybe i might take that statement back because i don't know if i could beat gavin wamsett out right now i mean that kid is extremely (laughs) talented i mean he has got a absolute cannon for an arm and uh i'm just excited for the offense in general i think you know he's got a little bit of a playing time um, he, uh, uh, you know, with coach Sharaka and, and, you know, the new offense and, uh, some of the options built in into that offense, I I'm excited, you know, it's, it's going to be a big year for them, I think. And, and, uh, and this year, you know, I think they're going to compete and I think they can surprise a lot of people and, and you never know anything can happen. You start getting to some wins together. Uh, but I think it's uh, this could be a potential big building year for them as well, and just for the program in general. Definitely. So I, I kind of want to circle back to the coaching clinic really quick. So obviously the headliner was Bill Belichick. What was it like hearing from arguably the greatest coach of all time, and what were some of the main takeaways you took from his conversation? Uh, coach Belichick, you know, he – he, it was kind of funny because a lot of the coaches come in, they do a 50 minute clinic on uh, position drills um, and, and they'll do about two or three, four drills uh, in 50 minutes. And then they'll, they'll show you the drill to show you, you know, how they do the drill, how it translate over to, to games or real life situation. And, and then, you know, coach Belichick comes in and he does, a, he speaks on uh, an hour and 20 minutes on, on one drill. And, and, you know, it's, there's a, it wasn't just a specific running back drill. It was one drill and it was a, you know, a running back, a blocker and a defender. And it was basically, you know, a defender trying to not let them get the edge. If they do get the edge, you know, how does he react? If he cuts up inside, he's got to retrace, you know, the blocker has got to try to get the edge. If he doesn't, he's got to do this. The running back, how he's going to run for for a hundred for an hour and twenty minutes, he talks on one drill and it's <laughs> extremely detailed, like just the hand placement, the fighting. You do this, you do that, and it, it it was comical because everyone else, you know, hit three or four drills within fifty minutes. He did one drill and spoke on it, and 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 he said, you know, this is we do this drill every single day. We're in pads. If we're not in pads. You know, we don't do it. But if we're in pads, we do this, you know, we can get aggressive, but, you know, we can protect the players, not do full team live periods. And another guy raised his hand and he goes, oh, so, you know, how long do you guys do this drill? You know, uh, 20, 30 minutes? Because, you know, he obviously just spoke an hour and 20. And Coach Belichick, you know, in his normal fashion, just looks at him like he's got four heads and he's like four to seven minutes. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> you know, first of all, it wasn't five to ten. It was four to seven. And then – and, and then, like, the, the detail he went on, and it's only a four- to seven-minute minute drill. I mean, it just goes to show you how, how detailed he is as a coach. And, uh, and the other thing, you know, the other thing he talked about was uh, Rutgers players 
that have come from Coach Yano. And he says there's two coaches in college football that he trusts and respects, and it's Nick Saban and, and Coach Greg Ciano. And, wow. and he said at the time when Coach Ciano left the first time, I think it was in 2011, Rutgers was – I think they said it was seventh in the nation with most active players in the NFL. And it's not Sounds because right. they had the most talented guys. Uh, it's because Coach Ciano gets them ready and – has them become men that are ready to go into the NFL or into the real world. No matter what life throws at them, they're ready. They're going to be able to deal with that. So they're mentally prepared. They're mentally tough. And, and coach Belichick said, you know, uh, that's, you know, the Rutgers players are ready for the NFL right away. They can, they can deal with that extra long season. They're not going to hit the wall the way other rookies do. And as he said, it's because the way coach, Shiano gets those guys prepared and he respects the crap out of them. So it was, it was really neat to see that aspect. And I can see that, you know, I, I never really had a chance to listen to coach Shiano talk up until, you know, about four weeks ago. And every single time he does, I learn something, um, you know, I got a pen notepad writing down and, uh, and you know, it's, it's just, sometimes you look back and you're like, man, I wish I had a chance to play for this guy. Cause you know, he motivates the heck out of you. He's a no nonsense guy. And as long as you're doing the right things and, and, and being at the right place at the right time, you know, you know, you're not going to have an issue with him. You know, he, he's, he's, he's a good co coach I, and I respect the crap out of him now. Now I want to go back to that, that Rutgers quarterback room. Um, you sat in the meetings, you saw the guys throw, you're a coach in your own right. What is some type of teaching or what kind of info would you give these quarterbacks currently? Uh, you know, it, it's, Make sure you're asking questions. Um, uh, I think uh, the other quarterback, uh, Evan, uh, really smart guy. He's not as athletic as Gavin, but extremely smart. Uh, plays the game well. Uh, takes care of the football, and uh, you know he would ask me questions. And and I and from what I just do is you know I remember back when I was in the NFL, there was a play. Uh, it was Fox 2XY hook, and you're going to go Y, X, fullback, tailback, and alert post. And I remember as a rookie, they're like, get to him quicker. Get to the X quicker. Get to number two quicker. And I'm sitting there going, like, how can I get to him faster? I'm coming off. I'm looking at the Y. I'm going as quick as I can. And then uh, Ty Detmer walks over to me, and he's like, hey. And he's like, Mac. He's like, if you, if you get cover three versus this play. The Y is going to be covered. So just X him out. As soon as you come off the fake, go straight to the X and throw mm -hmm. it. Trust it because the will is going to be tucked in off your play fake. Understand that. So I did that. And the coaches were like, oh, that's the way. To, and I'm like, well, why didn't you say that? <laughs> you know, if I get cover three, you know yeah. what? And so I think sometimes when you're coaching and you're so trying to help these guys here and there, you know, sometimes – uh, giving them like a little tip, you know, or, you know, uh, giving them a little tip of like, you know, pre-snap and, you know, if you get pre-snap man-to-man on a certain play, there's a good mm -hmm. chance this guy's going to pop open because there's a natural rub. And I kind of even, uh, I, you know, I was talking to Evan about that and I was like, yeah, you were a little late. They said, get to him quicker, you know, and just know that on this play, if you get man-to-man, -man, there's going to be a natural rub, expect it to pop open quick. And that way you can get it out of your hand fast. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised. And, and if it doesn't, well, then you can easily continue with your drop and just go through your normal progression. You know, but on a pre-snap read as a quarterback, you can kind of confirm it, you know, with that first second, oh, that's what it is, and there's a good chance that guy's going to pop. And so we talked about that. And the next time he got up and he hit it, he was like, oh, you all excited, kind of turned around, <laughs> pointed at me. And I was like, don't point at me. I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just sitting off to the side, you know. I was like, I don't want to get in yeah, trouble. Yeah. But that's just one thing I learned was pre-snap, post-snap, don't be surprised and have a plan. Like, you know, I know certain plays that have a plan versus cover one, cover two, cover three. And, and I think when you study an offense, you study your offense. This is my first progression, my second progression, my third progression. But you have to know it inside and out versus every coverage. And if you understand that, you can get there. And then the other thing is I always – well, because I coach quarterbacks now, I always say – your eyes will tell you where the ball goes. Your feet will tell you when. 
And so I think a lot of times when I watch guys in seven on seven, you see these high school guys, these, and they pick up the ball off the tee and they're just standing there hopping up and down and they're waiting, they're scanning the field. They're not really reading anything. They're waiting for a receiver They're, You know, by the time that receiver's open and they see it open and then they reach back and throw, well, you know, the window is going to be closed or at least you can get away with it in high school. Or if you have a strong arm, you can get away with it. But the higher level you get up, if that receiver's in the windows in, in the window that's open and you start your throw nine times out of 10, that ball's going to be broken up or your receiver's going to be carted off the field or it's going to be intercepted. So I always say, look, read your keys, read your defensive keys. And if the window opens up and the receiver's not there yet, your feet are telling you throw, trust your feet, throw it, trust the receiver will get to that spot in time. And that's when an offense gets to that next level. So that's why I'm always trying to teach quarterbacks eyes where feet when trust your feet and you got to trust your receivers to be there on time. Definitely. I mean, coaching is so much like you need to be an expert in your field, but you also need to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Cause if you're not a good teacher, you're, you could be the best, you could be the biggest expert in a certain type of offense, but if you can't translate that simply and you can't meet people where they're at, like you're, you're kind of pointless. Like you're as a coach, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Well, that, exactly. So as a coach, you're essentially a teacher and, and I always look at it is if this kid's not understanding it, you know, I'm not doing a good enough job teaching it. So then I always say, I'm like, yeah. well, what's, what, what other sports do you play? How can I relate to you? And, and I go back to a guy and, one of my high school quarterback coaches, you know, I was trying trying to struggle, trying to throw a fade route in the, like a cover two hole. And he's like, do you play golf? And I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, well, like if you hit a sand wedge, it goes really high. We don't want that. And if you hit like a, a two iron, it's line drive. We don't want that. We want like a five iron on that throw. And soon I was like, oh, okay, I got it. And then oh, I was able to God. get it. So just different sports in general. Uh, you know, quarterbacking a lot of time, keeping your weight back and, you know, as you're in the pocket. So when you step and throw, you can transfer. It's very similar to a hitter in baseball. You know, if you're sitting with your weight back, it's great. But if you get your weight forward and they throw you that curve, you know, you're going to be, you have no power. So if you're a quarterback with your weight all forward and all of a sudden you go to throw, you're going to have to come back, which is going to take more time, or you're going to throw it with no power. So I always, you know, get guys, make sure you're 80, 20, 80% weight on that back foot, 20% on that front foot. So when it comes, something comes open, the ball is locked and loaded and ready to come out with power. <laughs> so I think, I think understanding where kids, different sports they play, how you can translate to them uh, and, and just maybe sometimes take a step back and, and how can I get uh, through to this kid for him to understand exactly what I'm saying. And I, I think you, I think last year, another good example was uh, there was a lot of talk of um, Coach McDaniel's down in Miami, Florida. And I remember I was with him in the UFL briefly. He was our running backs coach, but a lot of receivers oh, wow. uh, were saying that you know he did a great job of helping them off the press. And he he instead of watching press release press releases, he was watching Allen Iverson on a crossover dribble. It's very similar setting up that DB. And a lot of receivers, uh, it, it translated with them. So I, I think it was like Stephon Diggs and a couple other guys. You actually looks like they're they actually look like they're dribbling a basketball and they're kind of doing it on the field. And and they laugh and they say that's where they got that from is because it helps them with that release. Yeah, because it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. You're trying to create space. It's just different sports. Exactly. So yeah, it's totally. It's you got to have that innovative mind sometimes to think a little bit differently to put things in perspective. For because a lot of these guys are dual threat, dual athletes. So a lot of them played basketball in high school and played football in high school as well. So, like you said, relating to them on different levels can just break down walls, create new total uh, paths for their their careers for sure. Of course. Um, Speaking of careers, Rucker, you basically left Rutgers with every record in the books. You were the first Rutgers quarterback ever drafted. Uh, talk about it. You know what? What was draft night like for you uh, in two thousand one? Uh, you know, well, you know, it was uh, it was a rough process. You know, it was, there's um, when you when you go through that draft process, there's a lot of talk. There's a like, you know, oh, he's going to go this draft. He's going to go here. This team's interested. That team's interested, and and everything that could have gone wrong for me on draft day went wrong. You know, there was a, uh, oh, wow. I remember uh, Kansas city was going to draft me in the third round and uh, Dallas was going to draft me in the second round. And uh, 
And I remember the second round came and Dallas ended up drafting Quincy Carter. And, and I remember, oh, yeah, I was so, Georgia, I remember him. yeah, but you know, the, the reason it was kind of funny, cause I remember uh, very vividly that Jerry Jones came out and was like, well, you know, I, I just had a feeling on Quincy. He and I had the same birthday. So I, I went with that and I was like, oh man, I was like, that's oh my gosh. Stinks, you know, and then, uh, <laughs> and then Kansas city, uh, they were trying to get, they were supposedly going to get Trent green and they couldn't get the deal done. So hmm. I, I think it was like two or three days before the draft, they went and picked up Bubby Brister and, you know, signed him as a free agent, gave him some money as a bonus up front. And then on draft day or the, yeah, on the draft morning or the night of the draft, they ended up getting Trent Green. So they were going to, they got Bubby and then they were going to still bring me in as a third round pick. And then they ended up going to get, uh, Trent Green, they ended up they ended up getting the deal done after what well, after all. So then now I'm off the board for Kansas City. So I'm like, great, now who's gonna get me? You know, and a lot of teams are taking guys. I remember that year the only two uh you know the the only quarterback that went the first round was Michael Vick, and then Drew Brees went the first pick of the second round. But um the the quarterbacks kind of fell and it was a big heavily D line draft that year, defense and uh and so just depending on how it went. Like I just, you know, kept on drafting and I remember dropping and I remember the only teams at that point, I was like, well, you know, Jacksonville or Detroit, you know, both of them said, you know, we would like you, but we're not drafting a guy till the fifth or sixth round and you probably won't be there anyway. So, you know, it was great meeting you and, and, but ended up coming out and Detroit ended up uh, drafting me. So, you know, it worked out. And, but again, it's, it's a, it's a very tough process. It, it, you know, some guys it's great and some guys it's awful. And, and so I was like, all right, well, I, I got drafted and, you know, I'm in Detroit and it is what it is. And eventually, you know, I ended up taking, I, I got to start as a, as a rookie and, uh, and then I'm getting injured like the second to last game against the Steelers broke my foot. Um, but, you know, they told me I was going to be the guy and I was going to um, be the guy of the future for them. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then there were some rumblings about <laughs> Joey Harrington. And I was like, oh, man. And they're like, no, it's a spoke screen. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. And uh, so they asked me to go to a draft party for the Detroit Lions. And I was like, oh, sure, of course. And I was like, just do me a favor. Like, just give me a heads up. Are we drafting this guy? Am I going to be blindsided? And they're yeah. like, no, no, we're not doing it. And sure enough, I'm at this draft party, and they draft Joey Harrington. And uh, oh, and I remember my, my quarterback coach called me, and he was like, I – I have no clue what just happened. It was just, there was a lot of like stuff behind the scenes. I eventually found out later down the road, but you know, they wanted a big name quarterback. They ended up, uh, you know, he had a big name. He was up for the Heisman campaign that year and, and, you know, they drafted him. So, you know, the writing's on the wall. It is what it is. When you get, when you pay a guy that much money, uh, you know, you're kind of like, all right, well, I just got to continue working hard, but it, you know, you kind of know where your role is going to be. So draft day hasn't yeah, been this, great to me. <laughs> Two years yeah, in a row. Still in the time time before the CBA where like those guys were getting like top of the, the NFL level deals. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of ended, I believe, after Matt Stafford. Yeah. Uh, so like 2006, 2007. Um, but what was like, guys always talk about like weird questions they get asked or like the, the strangest scenarios that they get asked in the pre-draft process. What stands out for you? Like the weirdest thing that happened to you in the pre-draft process from either a coach asking questions or a scout? Uh, I mean, there, there was a lot of, you know, just different questions. And I think when I look back, um, and then, and then there's a lot of like these, uh, these third party, uh, people and, you know, or companies that will do these, these tests. And it's like, you know, would you be, you know, what do you like better dogs or cats, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. And it, and it starts to become monotonous because there's, you know, maybe, uh, one company does, you know, works for like three teams and then another company works for another four teams. And it, it, but you still have to take all these tests and there's, you know, like 200, some questions, 300, some questions, and you're tired of filling them out. And you start to be like, all right, you know, you start flying through and you don't really take it so serious at that point, because you're at this point, you're like, all right, now I'm just exhausted. And it's the same stuff over and over. What does this have to do with football? And I think it's a lot of like people trying to understand like how a player likes to be coached or what he relates to. And I necessarily, I, I get it. There's a psychology part of it, but I don't agree with it uh, because I, I remember 
uh, like at times how certain guys got coached, how other guys got coached, other guys got yelled at, some guys didn't. And, and I don't necessarily agree with how those tests come out, those test results come out. I, I, I do think, and also, you know, you, you look at the NFL, a lot of these guys going into the NFL and they're making a ton of money and, but they're still kids and you see guys, you know, yeah. make mistakes off the field or get in some trouble here and there. And you have to understand that it, they are still kids, you know, and they're just in the public spotlight a little bit more. So uh, you look at a lot of guys, you know, maybe some guys, you know, there's a lot of kids getting in trouble, but you don't hear about it as much. And, and so when a guy does get in trouble in the NFL, like it's just the spotlights on him, and now this, the money, the dollars, oh, he's trouble. He gets labeled as certain guys. Uh, I remember they thought I was a party guy. Uh, I, I remember laughing because I had uh, uh, be, the summer before my senior, the summer before my senior year, you know, I had, you know, blonde hair, bleach blonde hair. Uh, and I ended up, you know, cutting it and then dying it back or dying it back and almost grew out or cutting it all stuff. And everyone's like, oh, you know, he's a little bit of a wild child. He's like Dennis Rodman. He's a party guy. And I'm like, wait a second. I drank maybe two or three times a year in college. It was like New Year's Eve and, and the 4th of July. I, I didn't even drink on my 21st <laughs> birthday. I wasn't a big partier. And I, I, there's a lot of perceptions that uh, these draft people, the scouts, they go in and they do their homework. But – are they really doing their homework? Do they really get a chance to sit down and learn the person uh, who they're who they're talking to and who they're drafting? Because I feel like a lot of guys, obviously, there's a there's a few guys out there. You know, you look at like the Johnny Manziel, like that. Yeah, that's that's not the best case, yeah, yeah. but but there's other mm -hmm. guys that you know they get these labeled these these bad things, and it, and I think it's completely wrong, and and you really have to try to get the to know the person maybe on a different level, maybe. Uh, maybe I know the teams are only allowed so many visits and this and that, maybe give teams more options to meet with these people because you, you meet a guy for the first time. You don't know, like, you know, some guys are quiet. Some guys are personable just because the guy's quiet. You know, sometimes, you know, people think he's cocky. Uh, is he really cocky or is he just a quiet, you know, kid, you know, and, and vice versa, you know? So it's, it's really difficult to label a kid. You know, when you only, only know him for a few years and then you talk to some people, you, I mean, maybe you talk to one of his coaches that didn't like him. Maybe you talk to a coach that really liked the guy. I mean, perfect example is when we were in Detroit, we had, uh, we had, uh, my, my third year, we ended up drafting, uh, Charles Rogers from Michigan state university. And, oh, yeah. yep. and we took, we chose him over Andre Johnson from Miami who went to the Texans. And you see how big Andre yes. Johnson is, his size, you know, and you look at the different careers and there was a lot of talk. They were going to, you know, Charles Rogers is the next Plaxico Burris, this and that. He had some trouble with marijuana. Uh, and so um, the draft came and we ended up taking, and Charles was a, I love Charles, really nice kid, really personable kid, but they wanted to get a receiver. And we, we chose him because at that time we just got a new receivers coach. It was uh, Bobby Williams from Michigan State, who was Charles's head coach at Michigan State. And he was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Charles is the guy. And I remember my buddy called me, you know, he was from high school and we were friends and he lived in the Detroit area. He's like, hey, how's this Charles Rogers kid? And I was like, really nice guy, really nice kid. He's got good speed, but he's a six foot four receiver that plays like he's five eight. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, well, you throw a fade ball to him or a slant. Everything he, he doesn't catch with his hands. He catches all forearms. Forearms and chest, forearms and chest. He won't go up high point catches. And I'm sitting there going, we just spent a third round draft or a third, the third pick of the draft, first round draft pick on a guy that doesn't catch with his hands. He catches forearms and chest. And, and like, so to me, you know, was it the scouts? No, I, I, I know some of the scouts did not want him, but a coach came in and vouched for him. And, and, and then he had some trouble. He said, oh, he's going to get the marijuana issues fixed. And that, that hit him. And he was suspended for a couple games here and there. So you look at stuff like that, and that's a perfect example. Well, maybe that guy shouldn't have been a first-round draft pick, but a coach vouched for him. Where there's other guys, you know, these get these bad raps. And, and then later down the road, they have these good careers. And it's because, you know, maybe a coach didn't like him. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into the draft that, uh, you know, there some things need to be changed so so coaches and, and scouts can get a better understanding of, 
you know, who the player really is as opposed to a, a one of these written psychology tests or, or these interviews on people that may or may not know someone, you know, and I get it. I understand it. But still, I, I think some things got to change because I think a lot of guys get hurt. And, and then and then just because of, you know, maybe one or two guys that you were know, some bad seeds, but there's been time and time again, it continues popping up. One or two guys pop up because someone vouched for them. And, and you know, you never know. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely tough, especially nowadays. Um, but I want to move on and talk a little bit about your NFL career. Uh, I know you didn't play your first snap, official snap, I guess, until week seven, week eight, I believe it was in your first year. What what was kind of your welcome to the NFL moment? Did someone just just lay down, lay the smack down on you, or like? No, you know, um, I think my welcome to the NFL moment was when I first got the playbook, and I was like, Oof. <laughs> I mean, this is tough. It's just trying to say the words. Yeah. Uh, um, it was a big playbook. And, um, I remember there was a play specifically, like, you know, they would, they would give you these plays and, you know, they can talk to the quarterback and I'm like, well, why don't you guys just give us a wristband? And it was like, well, no, Bill Walsh never gave his quarterbacks wristbands. And I'm like, yeah, but all these other teams do it. Like, well, Bill Walsh didn't do that. And this is how we do it here. And so they would be like, you know, they would be like sprint right G. And that's all they would say. So now I got to remember the play call sheet and the formation and the motion. And then you have to memorize that and then practice saying it. Because I would get in the huddle. And and then if you say it too fast, guys are like, whoa, whoa, rookie, slow down. So I remember I'd be sitting at home at night practicing, saying plays. And there was one play specifically that was like red left switch, Z right, sprint right G, U corner, halfback flat. And, you know, I had to say it over and over and over again for me to, to get that verbiage out. And um, I think that was kind of my welcome to the NFL moment because I remember calling home in training camp. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make this team. I really don't. And, and you know, this is, this is tough. I don't know if I can do this. And then I think it was the, our first preseason game. Uh, it was a home uh, – I think it was a home game. We were playing the Tennessee Titans and just being out in the field. and and uh, the crowd and the live bullets and once the game i was like man i love this so and it was just i was like i can do this i can do this so you know but but yeah i, I definitely the playbook and just going in and uh and you know you're just like wow these guys you know they're, they're big they're grown men some of these guys you know families kids and i'm just you know a young guy so it, it's it's definitely just showing up and that was uh and then there was another one I've never been to a place where a, a player has talked back to a coach before. We were in the getting ready to start our team meeting of training camp up in Saginaw Valley State University, and uh, the coach uh, Marty Morning we came in, and the, all the guys were talking, and and uh, there was a player up front, and I think he was he was you know Marty was joking, and he was like, "Hey, screw around, screw around, soon you won't be around." The guy got up and was like, "Hey, you don't want me here? I'll leave right now." And it was like, nah, just sit down, you know. But it was like, man, I was like, whoa, these players. I mean, you could see some of the players, man. They, there's a, a different level, you know. You, you can't really. It, it's a different. You can't really have that authority. You got to really talk to the NFL guys slightly different. I mean, because most cases, most of those players make more money than the coaches. And as a coach, yeah, you, yeah. you got to understand how to relate to them. You got to treat them like men, and and I think the best way to do it is be like, listen, hey, you know, I'm not going to get mad at you. I'm not going to get, you know, if you do this, you do that, you're just going to get fined, and you know, we're not even going to worry about that. We're just going to move on. You know, it is what it is. So, I mean, that's that's the the difference in the NFL and, and in college. So, uh, one of your teammates at Rutgers, Sean O'Hara, he was your center for most of your college career. You moved on and had obviously a great NFL career. Are you guys still close? And what's it like seeing that guy on TV all the time? You know, it's funny because uh, Sean really took me underneath his wing in college and stuff. And I was very appreciative of that. You know, he was he was definitely our best lineman. He was our starting left tackle. And I think a few games our center got hurt. So Sean had to come in and play center. And that's his true natural position. And, uh, yeah, Sean's always been a great friend to me. Uh, really, really good guy. You know, he – I went to go see him. Uh, I was a senior in college. He was with Cleveland. I went to go see him, I think, at a mini camp or a training camp. I can't remember which one it was. It was it was when I had some time off. And then, uh, but yeah, uh, and then he went to New York and the rest was history. And, you know, he's, he's got a couple of rings and great player. 
all that hard work paid off. He walked on at Rutgers, was an undrafted free agent. And, uh, you know, he deserves every, every bit of success he gets. And, uh, yeah, you know, as life goes on, you know, you don't talk to each other as, as often as you have. Uh, but, you know, here and there, you know, you see him and it's like, hey, what's up? You know, you shoot him a text and stuff like that. So uh, I, last week I was out Rutgers, uh, his, his O-line coach uh, at the Giants for a while. Was, you know, Rutgers O-line coach now, uh, Pat Flaherty. And, uh, and he was like, hey, you get, text O'Hara, tell him to get down here. And I did. And Sean was actually down <laughs> Disney World at the time uh, doing some stuff. So, uh, but yeah, you know, he said he may be back for the spring game. So um, I may try to get back out there as well then. I'm not sure if I can, but but yeah, yeah, Sean's a great guy and uh, you know, he deserves every bit of success, you know, just a hard work uh, person, he, he, everything he's done. Kind of sticking with uh, your time at Rutgers and um, I want to talk about your, your, your former head coach and Terry Shea. Mm -hmm. Talk about him and the relationship you guys had. And then how would, I know you didn't play for Shiano, but how would you kind of compare him and contrast him to Shiano? Uh, well, Coach Shiano or uh, Coach Shea, you know, we had a, we had a great relationship. Uh, uh, a lot of, you know, it's funny. A lot of people used to call him my dad. Uh, you know, Garrett Shea was there and was like, <laughs> he would be like, oh, your dad's over there. You know, um, he was tough. He was tough on you. He, he expected a lot out of you guys. Uh, however, we, we, we messed with him a little bit in college. Uh, uh, we, we got him on a few April <laughs> fool's jokes, uh, twice back to back. And, uh, and we got, we got yelled out pretty hard for both of them, but it was worth it just to get a good laugh. <laughs> uh, and then coach, Ye, uh, coach, Ye, uh, went on, uh, to coach with the chiefs, uh, learned Ver Vermeil with, uh, with chiefs and, and Al Saunders learned that offense. He went from the West coast to the, the number system, the greatest show on turf type offense. Uh, and then, uh, it was funny because, uh, you know, here and there remain in contact. And then the UFL, uh, I had played for Denny green and then, uh, and then I, my shoulder was re-injured. Uh, I had to get it cleaned up. And when I, when the doctor went in, in 2010, he was like, listen, you, sh you shouldn't ever throw again. He's like, you got bone your, you, the, after your first surgery. Uh, when I blew it out, they, when they went in and, and did the surgery, they did it a little too tight. And so every time I was throwing, you know, I was just. just... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the cartilage was just getting uh, just worn down. And now it was bone on bone. They like, you shouldn't throw. You're going to have uh, you're going to need a shoulder replacement. So. It was in 2011, I get a call from Coach Shea, and he's like, hey, I'm sitting in a meeting. I'm, I'm coaching for the Uf, uh, UFL Virginia Destroyers, and uh, they're looking for a veteran backup. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I totally forgot about you. I haven't heard from you in a while. And uh, our defensive coordinator, Kurt Schottenheimer, was like, I got a guy, Mike McMahon, because Kurt was my D coordinator in Detroit. And, and Coach Shea was like, oh, I love Mike, you know. So they brought me in, and I, I was like, Coach, I was like, I can't can't throw you know or I, I can throw but they told me i shouldn't and he's like well we're just looking for a backup to help the younger guys you know you can it's just an emergency i'll keep your throws to a minimum and i was like all right i'll go do it so and uh, he's like let me just have you work out and we'll see how you throw and i was throwing fine still and he was like all right let's do it so it was great and uh and i got a chance but that, to me I, I always look back and uh, that that was one of the greatest compliments i've ever received throughout my entire career was the d coordinator who I rarely really interacted with uh, all the way. This was 2011. This was from back in 2003. He, you know, I would be with him and, and I would just go out and compete every day running the scout team. And so for him to sit there and suggest me, a guy from the opposite side of the ball, that was the greatest compliment I ever got because it just showed that I was a hard worker in practice. So, but Terry Shea, you know, he brought me in. It was great. And, you know, we still talk a little here and there. I actually saw Garrett this past week, Garrett Shea, who was one of my teammates, and Terry's son. He's still in Jersey. He came to see Coach Belichick talk. I saw Garrett and his son. It was great to see them. Haven't seen them in a while. Uh, and Coach Chiano, um, Coach Shea was very detailed. Um, but I think, you know, the, a few things, you know, one, he, he was a West Coast guy. He was a California guy. Um, I think uh, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, so – a lot of people just wanted a Jersey guy, even high school coaches to help push 
recruits there, you know, oh, California guys there. So it was tough to, to get that. I think Coach Yano has done a great job of recruiting the Jersey area, the New York area, the Eastern PA area, that trying to keep the best players from there going there. He, he's attacked Florida. He's done a great job of getting some speed from Florida. Um, I think Coach Yano is a, it, um, how they defer. He's definitely a, a little bit more, you know, Coach Shea, you, you had to work hard and, you know, he would let you have it. But I, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think some of the buttholes are a little tighter around with Coach Yano. He was like, hey, I mean, there's a, high, there's a standard <laughs> here, and you better live up to it. And I think even some assistant coaches feel that sometimes, like, hey, this is this is what is expected of you. You better get it done. And and I appreciate that, that because to me, the guy, yeah. Coach Yano, likes things done a certain way. And you do it the right way, there's going to be no issues. You do it on time. You get everything done. And I appreciate that. You know, he's a no-nonsense guy. He's a very black and white guy. There's no gray area. It's just boom. And I and I, I love that. I like, you know, someone that's going to be right right in your face, be very honest with you. Hey, this is what's going on. This is why you're not playing. This is why you are playing. And uh, But I think he's doing a tremendous job. And, and you know, he's coached. He's got a bunch of experience all over. You know, um, you know he was at Miami. He was at – he played at Bucknell. He was at a GA at – Penn State under Paterno was down at Miami with Butch Davis ran a great defense down there he's you know Rutgers he's been in the NFL he's got that experience he's gone over to Ohio State learned from Urban Byer a little bit uh the even when he was out you know he, he even spoke that he you know he went and you know was a volunteer coach at the high school level uh, as a, a the assistant D-line coach I and mean, everyone was laughing because like oh they they brought you on as assistant why wouldn't you just give <laughs> But, you know, it just goes to show he, he loves the game. Yep. He loves the game. He's not afraid, you know, hey, he's going to humble himself wherever you need me. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's just a tremendous coach. And, like, anytime he walks in and, and, and addresses the team, uh, like, he, there's a teaching point in those team meetings and I had my, my pen and notepad out the first day I sat there and I didn't realize, and I'm like trying to type notes on my, on my phone and I couldn't keep up. So the next time I made sure I had my pen and paper and uh, you know, cause I, I learned a lot from them and uh, situational football, whether it be situational football, whether it be life experience, he's a great teacher. And I think he's a great mentor for not only the players, I think for coaches as well. Definitely. So we've talked about your career, uh, both on the field and you mentioned you were a coach. What are you up to these days? So, no, I, uh, so I coached high school this past year. I was the past game coordinator. We went on, uh, we started off a little rough start. We were one and three, but we ended up winning every game after that and won the state title, uh, ended up winning. Uh, Hell yeah. we beat Imitep charter. Uh, they had seven power five guys on scholarship going to their school. We had, uh, not really anyone, but, uh, the kids bought in. We had a, you know, <laughs> the Imitep Charter. They decided to line up and just do their thing, play man to man. And I was like, man, you, I played with Andy. I, I was underneath uh, Coach Andy Reid, and uh, that guy's the master at man to man rub routes. So you guys want to do that? We, we got something for you. So uh, that was this past year. I took a step away, and now uh, a lot of guys were asking me to to do private lessons and. Um, and I was very torn on it, but um, just because, you know, I love coaching and, and at the same time, so I don't want to be coaching for a team and then doing this and then those players come and uh, expect that they're going to be starting because they come there. Also, the uh, it, it's it's very difficult for me because, uh, you know, my buddy and, uh, you know, my buddy and my girlfriend are like, you know, this is, you know, you got to let us handle the business side of it. You're too nice. You, it's still business. And, you know, like we'll handle the pricing. So I actually reached out to a buddy of mine who I, uh, I played against in high school, Madi Williams. And he actually trains yeah. quarterbacks out of, out at North Jersey. And I think it's mad QB. He, he does, but yeah. great quarterback coach. We talked and I asked about his pricing structure, how he does things. And, and he was very nice enough to share some of his info. And I kind of went off the same format he does. And, so uh, I do train quarterbacks out of Western PA. Um, started off slow. It's picked up. And the only really – it's kind of word of mouth or social media for me, Twitter or Instagram. And, um, and now, I, you know, I, 
tried first it was trying to find an indoor facility but now that it's nicer you get out in the fields and stuff and it really picks up and I, I like to see uh the kids improve and and so fortunately for me i haven't had one guy who showed up once and just never come back every you know everyone they get something out of it and and it's it's nice when you get messages from the parents saying oh you know my son's uh improved so much his arm strength's doing this he's doing this and and so to me that makes me feel a little bit better i'm adding value to them and so uh, that's what I'm doing right now, and uh, I would love to. I would love to be coaching at a higher level. I would love to be coaching at the Division One football le- uh, level, whether it be uh, uh, you know a quarterback coach or uh, a receivers coach or something along those. Something I'm where I'm more comfortable with, uh, and then work my way up. Or even you know, ideally, I would love to be in the NFL. You know, start off quality control or even NFL internship. It's kind of tough though because. Those are typically right now they're a little safe for the, you know, it's a minority internship. So uh, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. But, you know, if someone were to give me that opportunity, I would I would jump at a second. And I know my work ethic would would show and I would be able to work my way up because I love football. I love helping. I, I, I truly want to be at that highest level because I look at when I was in the NFL, um, you know, quite honestly, my best quarterback coach was Ty Detmer. He was a backup quarterback he wasn't even the coach and and I feel that quarterbacks that have played at the highest level and have played the game uh, I think those typically make the great quarterback because like, obviously there's a time you know you can study it and do this and do that and not have played and still be a good coach but I think the quarterback position really helps if you have a quarterback a former quarterback coaching it because he's been in those situations he understands what it's like to get pressure and different coverages and different types of pressure situations. And, you know, I think with the, with the Lions are doing right now with Mark Brunel, that's, that's phenomenal. And I think he's doing a great job, but I would love to get my foot in the door, be a quality control guy, work my way up to a quarterback coach, and then eventually uh, be a, an OC at, uh, at the highest level. Do I have aspirations to be a head coach? Absolutely not. <laughs> I just want to be a, I love the, uh, I don't want to deal with the off the field stuff so much a head coach has to deal with. I love doing the football stuff. I love, doing the offense. Uh, I love game planning. I love watching teams and trying to figure out how I can attack a different team and, and show players. But at the same time, working in a quarterback room and talking to these guys and sh- talking to them about how to deal with the media, how to deal with off the field issues. Uh, Cause I know I made my fair share of mistakes. And I think if someone would have guided me a little bit better and it's my own fault, but you know, obviously I think, if you get guys that have been there and in in those positions that have been truly humbled by certain things, you know, I think you can really get through to those players a little bit more. And I think those guys still need quality coaching. I I, I really do. Um, you look at the NFL and and a lot of it's basically the uh, uh, you know the position coaches you know do some drills and stuff, but a lot of it's the OC and and I I still think there's a lot more that could be done at that that those position works and just build relationships as opposed to just being a business. Now, let me ask you this, are there any notable quarterbacks that we should keep an eye on for the future over in Western PA? I know they're producing talent at like a Yeah, there's um there's a kid um Julian Duggar. Now he's he's kind of well known mm-hmm. from Penn Hills right now. Uh I do think some people are looking at him, you know, like, well, hey, can he play receiver? He's more of an athlete. I'm like, listen, you know, he's, he's – the more he comes, you can see him improve every single day. And he's becoming a quarterback. He's becoming a passer. And I, I think the system he's been in, you know, it's been a, you know, a run system, you know, read option from the gun. They don't really put him in the best position to do dropbacks. And – and I think that's kind of hurting him in his recruiting opportunity because people think he's just, you know, he's a big athletic guy that can run and he can throw the ball and he can throw the ball well on the run. He can throw the ball well from the pocket. He's extremely accurate. And I think that's one guy. Another guy is Caden Olson. He's actually going to the University of Penn. And, um, you know, and, and for whatever reason, Pitt was recruiting him early on. They fell off. But he's, you know, he's a good 6'5", you know, 225. And. His arm strength's improved. Uh, his velocity's improved. He, his feet are improving. Um, now, I had spoken to Duke about him, but, you know, they he, he would have had to apply. He could have walked on, 
but he didn't apply, and now he's past the deadline because they said if he would have applied and got in on his own, they would have taken him. But um, I think he's another guy that would probably play one or two years at Penn and maybe move up. Um, there's another kid by the name of Luke Costco uh, out, of, out of Thomas Jefferson. Um, um, for, he played one year. He started as a freshman at St. LaSalle, and, uh, and then he transferred uh, to a sophomore season. For You know, I think it's a – it's a shame that the PIAA and the WIPIO, the Western PI, uh, uh, the Western PA Football Association, you know, they suspended him because he transferred. And and typically, you allow a kid to transfer between his freshman and sophomore year, but you know, because he started, you know, the, oh, it's athletic intent. Well, now you're forcing a kid to sit out, and you know, his family moved and stuff. But you know, but he still he he'll have two years left of eligibility to play. But he had to sit out last year. He's another kid that's got tremendous talent. I think he'll be a I think he will be one of the, after this season, one of the top uh, underclassmen uh, recruits. I know Stone Saunders is kind of the big name right now. I think Luke Costco will, will be right next to him, if not past him after this year, if he gets coached properly, if the system they run is good. But I, I, but I do think it's a shame that in uh, Pennsylvania, kids get penalized for transferring. You know, I understand you want to keep the competitive field of balance, you know, maybe allow a kid to transfer you know, to a different class. If he's in 4A, allow him to go 5A, 6A, or 3A. Just don't go 4A to 4A. Uh, because honestly, like some coaches, you know, you know, they can like essentially, you know, limit a kid on how he plays and they're not really playing to his strengths or promoting his strengths. And therefore, this is a time and where kids can get an opportunity to go to a college and and set themselves up for the rest of them life, uh, rest of their life, whether it be playing athletically or even a good school. And and I think a lot of coaches have too much power here because of the transfer rule. And it's it's a shame, but there's some good play, there's some good talent that will be coming out of the Western PA area. Definitely uh, Julian Duggar this year and, and Luke Costco, though I would look uh, keep an eye out for. So you told Chiano about all these guys, right? Just making sure. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, but you know, I, but I, I do. You look at Gavin Wimsett, and if he's got, I think he's got three years of eligibility, two or three years. Yeah. And and personally, just me me watching him, if Rutgers team has some success, or has success with him at the quarterback spot, I think he will be a number one, a first round draft pick uh, someday. I think. Wow. Uh, you the way the game is going, you know, he stays healthy. He's six three, two twenty five. Uh, and he runs a four or five, and and he's got a cannon. I mean, I think, I if yeah, I think if you were to have him throw a ball as far as you could, I bet you he could throw it over eighty yards. I, I really do. Um, wow. So if he stays healthy, I, I think he has that opportunity. I think if if Rucker struggles a little bit, I I I still see him uh, uh, being maybe uh, you know. At worst, a low second, just because of his athletic ability, his size, and his arm strength. Uh, I think wow. uh, his arm is a cannon. He's good accuracy, and uh, as long as he stays healthy and he can still move and run, and his arm is healthy and has that full strength, I think that kid's going to have a bright future in the NFL. I really do. I mean, I, I was thoroughly impressed. It's just can he can he translate the game up to his head? And I think uh, Coach Kirk Scirocco will get him there. Stronger arm in their prime. Gavin Wimsat, Mike McMahon. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> before my injury, before my injury. Uh, in your prime, in your prime. I'll give you that. Yeah, I, I blew my shoulder out in uh, against Virginia Tech uh, my junior season okay. at Rutgers. That season, we played a game at, I, I think it was either my sophomore year or my junior year. We opened up the season at Cal Berkeley. We went out a day early. The air was a little thinner. I was like, yeah, man, I feel pretty good out here. I can throw the ball a little further. <laughs> and so in the pregame the day before, I went out and uh, I ended up throwing a ball from goal line all the way across the field, and we, we totaled it off at 84 yards. So wow. I don't know. I don't know how far Gavin can throw it, but that's the furthest I got it. Now, at the same time, I wish someone would have told me, you know, not until I went to Detroit, Johnny Morton, my first day, was like, do not throw the ball that hard to me this close ever again. You know, and I learned, you know, slant routes, you know, under routes, in breaking routes, take some off. You want to complete, you know, everywhere I've been, coaches are like, hey, just get it to him as quick as you can. Give him the fastball. And uh, 
And yeah, and it didn't help because, you know, the, the, there was a lot of drops, you know, a lot of tip balls. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, my, our receiver, Andy Holland, we were, uh, and it was my junior year. We were out there practicing. It was a two-a-day practice, no gloves, just, just helmets. And I let a dig rip over the middle of the field. And when he uh, was running, the ball went right between his, the, the two, the two fingers, Ooh. his middle finger and his, and his ring finger and he had no gloves on but the ball was spinning and moving so fast that when it hit there it split the webbing of his hand right down the middle about Ooh. halfway down so he had to get oh. stitches and tape his fingers for the rest of the season so uh Jeez. that was a 15 yard dig run that's not something I'm but you know i had a strong arm i mean but no one told me to take that <laughs> off the football you know so i had to learn the hard way johnny morton told me uh hey rookie don't do it i won't catch it and so uh, yeah, it yeah. took a while, but yeah, you know, it's nice to have that strong arm when you need it. And it just took me a while to learn, uh, you know, it took me to the NFL to learn to take some off the football. So uh, I think once young quarterbacks learn that as well, it can help them as their careers as well. Cause a lot of kids will throw the ball extremely hard on a slant route and it makes it difficult for your receiver. So uh, taking some off the football, getting that completion, however it is uh, definitely will help uh, young players. But Gavin, I, I, and I did speak to Gavin. He did he did let one rip in practice, and I told him the same story. I told him all that, and <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, I, I kind of let that one that one go a little fast on that one." I was like, "Yeah, your receiver had no chance. I mean, you, you were like literally <laughs> ten yards away, and it like went right through his hands, and 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 uh, and he had gloves on and everything." I'm like, "Yeah, you got to you, you the the object is complete the football not throw it as hard as you can and he was like no you're right you're right so no he's a good young kid i, I expect big things from him that's awesome uh you've been so generous with your time here mike uh we want to let you go but is there anything you wanted to to plug before we head out and where can we find you on social media you mentioned twitter and instagram yeah uh no again i do the quarterback training if anyone's interested but uh and i do private training um i do private i do semi-private i do group training my Instagram and my Twitter is the exact same. It's uh, Michael E. McMahon, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-E-M-C-M-A-H-O-N. Uh, it just so happened, you know, my middle name starts with an E, and uh, I was able to lock down both of those for, on Instagram and Twitter, so I kind of kept it. So that's what my Instagram and Twitter is. That's my only two social medias. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on, as Coach Belichick says, Snapface. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's all. If you need to get a hold of me, that's how you get a hold of me. Or you can email me at, uh, QB coach Mac M A C at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, everybody listening at home, thanks again for tuning in. This has been another edition of the night report podcast signing off.